So, hi folks, good, mo good morning everyone uh, here in that webinar. Welcome to our webinar about automated driving in the special light on of uh, the ISO TR4804. So, what is exactly behind? You will see that in the course, or we will hear that in the course of that webinar. So, so just to introduce myself, my name is Arnold Bratz. I'm uh, one of the managers at Vector Consulting Services, leading the team of uh, safety and security experts. Typically with me um, is Andreas Horn, a colleague of mine. Today he's not with me, so he has another uh, appointment. So uh, the host of this webinar, Thomas, will, will support me here concerning questions because typically in the course of that, of all the webinars the Vector is running, we have the opportunity to place uh, some questions in the question and answer window of your WebEx client. And you can do that all the time. Uh, unfortunately, while I'm talking, typically I don't see all the questions upcoming, right? Uh, so I cannot answer in between. That's one of the reasons why we're gonna have a break in the course of the webinar somewhere. After the first half of the webinar, we will have a short break to pick up with at least two or three questions. So Thomas will support me there and pick up a few of your questions and I will try to give a fast and sound answer to it. And then we will, of course, go ahead with the webinar. And so most likely after the webinar, we will have still some open questions. So, uh, so don't, don't be impatient. Uh, you can wait after the meeting and stay tuned. Uh, I will answer all the questions, at least for those who are still in the, in the chat after the webinar. Uh, and latest, uh, if you don't have time to wait, uh, I will answer uh, these questions typically one day after the webinar, but tomorrow is the weekend, so we will not answer questions, I think. But uh, next week on Tuesday, so on Monday is public holiday in Germany, uh, I will then uh, get a log of all your questions and give you an answer by email, so if you have no time, right? But of course, if you have time, so stay tuned after this webinar. So that is one thing concerning the content of the webinar. So if you have technical issues, I hope everybody can hear me now, right? Uh, otherwise, everything is in when I'm doing here, right? Uh, so uh, put your your issues, uh, whatever I cannot hear, I cannot see, uh, I have some other difficulties, put it in the chat window. So the chat window is the interface to our host for the webinar. Okay, so far, so good. That's the about the preconditions for that webinar. I hope everything wants well. So I would then like to go ahead with the webinar itself, starting with introducing, of course, first a bit Vector and Vector Consulting Services. I assume I don't need to talk much about Vector because if you would not know Vector, you would not be here in that webinar. So you have a bit of an idea what's going on there. Um, and, uh, but a few words uh, for Vector. Uh, of course, uh, Vector is a company in the area of toolings, uh, test tools, uh, even embedded software like AutoZar is in the portfolio. Uh, it's a company, meanwhile, uh, three, more than 3,000 um, employees working for Vector worldwide, so across the globe, wherever you find car manufacturers or suppliers in the automotive industry, you will find a site of Vector. Um, and a more smaller part of the whole thing is the consulting part. So Vector Consulting Services is its own company, but it's 100% owned by Vector. And we are doing consulting business, mainly, of course, independent from the other products of Vector. So it's not about tools. So it's more about what you can see here on this slide. So we have four areas we are working on. This transformation, the classic consulting business about process and transformation of organizations. There's also SPICE in as a process model. That is one area. There is the trust area. That is a very well known, or I would say it's a kind of uh, always, uh, always on uh, topic in the industry because it's about safety and security. And these are the topics since years. Uh, we have a lot of business in and a lot of new standards coming in. We will also talk about that today. Uh, it's about um, classic functional safety, but it's also about the so-called SOTIF safety. It is about cybersecurity uh, and the methods coming along with that, like pen testing and stuff like that. Uh, that is all the trust. Then we have, of course, more technology-dependent consulting activities. Uh, when you introduce uh, new technologies like AutoZAR, then, of course, or new tools, then we can support there. And across everything, we do trainings, uh, trainings on safety, security, and all the stuff. 
Uh, we will talk about that a bit at the end of that webinar. Let me let you know what kinds of trainings are planned and, and where you can find uh, uh, related um, pages on our home homepage to to uh, to join this training and to find out what is offered by Vector Consulting Service. Okay, yeah, m maybe uh, you heard it already between the lines. So of course, even even like Vector, even uh, Vector Consulting Services is is mainly working in the automotive industry. So that is our main branch we are in. But of course, embedded systems in, uh, across different industries and branches like aerospace and medical and transport, they are not so different, right? So software and system engineering in the area of embedded systems, that is something um, it's similar, let's say. Standards are different, but the technologies are very similar. So we do also offer our consulting service in these industries, but I would say more than 90% is, is automotive. Okay, yeah. As always in this webinar, we show a bit uh, about our surveys we do every year, what are our customer thinking in general, not only about autonomous driving or stuff like that, or safety and security. It is a general question, what are the short-term and what are the long-term changes? And then we make up typically uh, at the beginning of each year, kind of two-dimensional diagram shows the result of that survey. And so we see, in the very right side, the, the short-term challenges, and in the upper area of the diagram, the long-term challenges. And so it's always interesting to see what topics are more the short uh, terms, what are more the long terms, or maybe both. And you see in this picture, it is not radically changing every year. So we have always these transformation, dealing with complexity stuff, distributed development. It's always somewhere in the middle of, of the challenges, a bit short-term, a bit long-term, but not so obvious and uh, not so clear picture. Then we have always a quality area on quality and cost that is always uh, short term uh, and sometimes it's even long term that a bit depends a bit. And currently the situation is a bit quality is seen as a short, more seen as a short term challenge because the bright shining star across everything in the top right corner. So it is everything that is innovation and of course you all read newspapers and you know what's ongoing in the, in the automotive industry. So we have a lot of uh, stuff to do with what, what is typically called digital transformation, uh, but it is not about just digital transformation of companies. It's about new technologies being introduced into the car, like electric driving, like connectivity, like autonomous driving, and exactly that is the topic of our webinar today. So it seems to be very much, um, yeah, um, important from our customers' point of view that we talk about that and that we have to master these challenges of bringing in innovations, of course, without ignoring stuff like quality and the classic safety and security is a quality attribute. So we cannot ignore that. We cannot just be innovative because the, most of the companies are not just startups. We are delivering cars and components for cars which are really driving on the road out there. So quality and related standards are important to be fulfilled. Right? Okay, that is a big picture in our industry. So let's start with talking about autonomous driving itself as a topic for the webinar. So introduction is kind of uh, kind of comic, right? Um, so what happens today in the life of a modern car? So this is a picture, a real life picture taken somewhere. I think it's Bangalore. Uh, the pictures have been made, um, but I'm not sure. It has been made by my by a colleague of mine, not by myself. But I think it's in Bangalore somewhere. So and it is, of course, a normal taxi you see here. And let's assume this is an automatically driving car, right? And you, the car is looking to the front, the front window somehow by by sensors, of course. And they say um, they look at, yeah, that is a kind of urban traffic situation. We see a car coming in front of us, but we see something strange there out, right, on the road. What is what is there? Yeah, coming closer, we see. Hmm, classified as a chair. What what does a chair do on the street of a town? I have no idea, right? But but okay, what can we do as an automatically driving system? Okay, let's follow the other car which is in front. Maybe that is a good rule, right? Because the other car hopefully knows what is the right approach. Um, and then we're coming closer and we see who? That's interesting. Uh, the chair, there was a reason for the chair. It was not an accident because it was a big hole. Most likely, some kind of construction works uh, on the street. 
uh, they left a hole or it's just cracked by whatever kind of reason. So that is something um, what we would call uh, in, in, in meanwhile, if you talk about uh, whatever kind of autonomous driving, these kind of edge cases. Of course, it's not an all day event, right? It's not a bit uh, undergo that kind of, um, or that they are in such kind of situations or scenarios every day, maybe drive to work or whatever. But that can happen uh, during lifetime of a car and during lifetime, of course, of a driver. Uh, that we have such kind of very interesting situation we have no, never have had before, and we have no idea how to deal with that. As human beings, you know how to deal with that, right? So even this driver here had to found a solution to come around uh, driving into that hole. But uh, for an automatic driving system, not sure if we are prepared for that. And that is, of course, uh, our topic today, what, what is already there and what needs to be done in future to more systematically look at into the area of vehicle scenarios. So what, what, is, what, is, the, what is the scenario of a vehicle finally uh, apart, of course, from, from just driving and everything is okay. So what are the scenarios we try to avoid? So one scenario, of course, the, the kind of reliability scenario. Uh, so the car is behaves unreliable. That typically means we have, we have an internal fault in electronics or software if you talk about EE system. We didn't talk about mechanical issues. So the ECU, one of the many ECUs in the car failed, whatever, I don't know. The windows are rolling down and cannot be rolled up again. The flash uh, lights are going on and cannot be switched off. The airbag says, um, I, I cannot uh, deflate uh, because uh, yeah, in a crash situation, I would not protect your life because of some internal fault. So whatever, and maybe in the worst case, uh, the car is just standing still, cannot further drive, and you would just roll out to the left side or right side of the road. That is unreliability. And of course, that is a classic scenario of quality we try to avoid. Of course, that should not happen to a car. Same thing is unsafe, right? That is not internal, by whatever kind of reason, right? Uh, a car is bumping into a pedestrian as one example, and is hurting that uh, pedestrian. That shall be, shall be avoided. Of course, reason behind is uh, typically uh, limitations of sensors maybe, or maybe human beings behave in a way it has not been foreseen by whatever kind of design of the car. And so uh, the accident happens. And of course, we want to reduce these accidents or uh, reduce these kind of scenarios so that they not happen or that they not, not happen very likely or happen very unlikely, however you look at this. The third one is a quite new one. Since we have connectivity on cars, we even want to uh, avoid these unsecure scenarios, which could mean someone is stealing data from the car. Okay, that would be one case, but it could also lead to something like a hazard or internal failure. So the unsecure uh, scenarios are very broad. They can also lead to these other, un uh, these other unwanted uh, scenarios. So altogether, the also three types of scenarios are forming a kind of set of scenarios we want to avoid. And that is, meanwhile, the main goal of system engineering, not only to provide a new functionality on the car, it is to, to avoid these three kinds of scenarios we don't want to see uh, being on the car. So luckily, you could say, yep, all these three scenarios um, are somehow covered already by international standards, right? So the most famous one, ones are shown here. So we are not in the beginning of that. So since decades, we know about QM stuff, about reliability. So we have standards like SPICE or meanwhile IATF 6949 for the normal quality of EE system, normal in terms, not really tied to safety, it's just the correct and fulfilling of requirements. So then we have since, I don't know, more than 10 years, meanwhile, uh, the function is safety, which is a part of reliability, it deals with quality issues, which, but that is a special portion of quality issues, which could lead to unsafe scenarios. Then we have the SOTI standard, the safety of the intended functionality, which is a more general safety standard. This is really dealing with, okay, what can happen to my EE system in terms of design failures or limitations and could lead then to harming people without any fault. And then we have the cybersecurity standard 21434, ISO, uh, which is nearly uh, published, so a few months left until publishment, but meanwhile, 
it is known outside, I think, because since years they are working on that standard and they have published some versions in between. So there is something out there in terms of standards to cover these scenarios we don't want to have. So that's the good news. Uh, if you now look from the other side, uh, what is behind these standards? Yep, uh, if you look at functional safety, then we try to avoid systematic and random faults than to avoid uh, these unwanted scenarios. If you look at the SOTIF standard 2148, then it's about uh, functional insufficiencies, again, limitations of sensors, actuators, and so on, or design issues, and also foreseeable misuse by human being. That is part of that standard and attacks any kind of uh, cybersecurity attacks to avoid or to detect them and to mitigate them. That is uh, part of the ISO 214 uh, report, the cybersecurity standard. So far so good. So the task we have now in the industry is to bring all these standards together into a process world kind of, because they are all kind of risk-based approaches. That is the common, common part of all these standards that helps a bit to implement these standards. But still, that is a big task because not only the processes have to be adapted to these standards, even functions we have on board, the EE functions we implement on the car, have to follow requirements partially given by these standards. So the question is, is that are we prepared, let's say, to, to implement all these standards in our process and to put, uh, on our products, even on high, higher levels of automation, right? So maybe it's time to deduce the term higher level of automation. Of course, even that is mean by no, we typically subdivide automation in, well, let's say, five levels. Uh, level zero, we can leave that out, no automation. But level one and two, that is what we know today as classic ADA systems. And then we have the level three, four, five, which are seen at the higher levels of automation. That is, of course, in new stuff here. Um, and so the question is, do we get enough support by these standards to really being guided to implement our processes? And yeah, the, the answer is no. <laughs> uh, yes, there is some guidance, of course, but if there is sufficient guidance that we will see on the next slide coming after this one. But uh, first of all, I think it makes sense to introduce uh, the standard we have not talked about so far. We have just um, dropped the name. That's the ISO TR4804, quite new standard. Uh, we will come to that in a second. It's not really a standard, it's a technical report. So TR stands for technical report. But we will see that it's somewhere turning into be into a standard, but, but currently it's not. It's more kind of summarizing uh, recommendations and state of the art of technology and engineering in one paper. But anyway, it's a well-known and worldwide published paper. It's an ISO document. And that says, oh, that is named uh, safety and security for automated driving systems. Before we compare all these standards, so we have now a fourth one, uh, let's look into the ISO TR4804, what's in there. So the first message is, uh, it is of course, even that is a risk oriented approach. So they have um, for, for higher level automation, they have focused on levels three and four. So five is not in. And they have a very, let's say, specific approach for that uh, risk uh, balancing. So one part of that is known as the avoidance of the unreasonable risk. That is also known from SOTIF standard and from other risk-based standards in the safety area. So we try to reduce risk. We cannot avoid each scenario. That's the message behind. But we can reduce the likelihood to a level that is acceptable for the community of human beings, right? So that is a kind of very simple description of that. The other one is, uh, but that is added now by the TR4804, to have a positive risk balance. That is a bit more than just avoiding risks. It is saying whatever you introduce into the public traffic, it has to be better than what was there before by numbers, by accident numbers. So we have to reduce accident by your level of automation or whatever kind of feature you introduce. Uh, it has to be measurable better than before. That is a bit more strict now by the standard. And of course, it makes sense to put that strictness uh, on a risk-based approach if we talk about level three, four, five, or let's say three, four, basically. But we talk about unreleasing the driver from the authority to drive the car. And so that has to be better than the driver itself. Otherwise, it makes no sense. Maybe, maybe technically it's fun, maybe, but it makes no sense from 
from the risk-based uh, point of view, because if you are not better than before, then let the driver be in charge in responsibility to drive the car. So there is one one idea of that, the kernel idea of that new standard. And of course, you see it here kind of at the bucket below, there are still the three known standards in there. So IT262, function safety, cybersecurity, and SOTIF, they are all in here. They are not replaced. They are tied together in that uh, new standard. And they're doing it with a more qualitative approach. So still, that's no surprise. Uh, the TR, the technical report, is not the final document. They are still working on that. But they have already published things to let the community know what is what is out there in terms of knowledge and concepts. So it's not finally finished. So there's no quantitative approach for the risk-based approach for the positive risk balance. But there is a qualitative approach, and it's, it's somehow on two pillars. So across the two pillars, we have principles for safety and security. You can see them as kind of high-level requirements. We will have a look at this in the course of the webinar here. Uh, and we have a safety by design pillar that's kind of left leg of of the uh, uh, of the D cycle. If you have that model in mind, and we have the right part that is the verification validation part, kind of right leg of the V cycle. So that is in that standard purely qualitatively approach. There are even some annexes in there about neural networks, how to deal with that, but they are really at the beginning. So the main contribution is having these both pillars and tying the existing standards together. Along with these tying, an interesting, interesting concept is uh, created, which is not known by the other three standards, but it's something new, again, without replacing. Um, that is the term of a safe and secure function. So if we, um, we will see on the next on the next page what we mean by that. But that is an interesting concept. We have to look a bit deeper to that. Before we leave the uh, overall picture of the TR4804, maybe a few words. Again, it's a technical report. It's in, it's still an informative document. It's not a requirement. It's not a legal document in a string in a strict sense. Uh, but it will turn soon into a, what they call a technical specification, a TS. Even if TS is not a standard, that is a far away uh, goal. But the next step in the next years is uh, to turn into a technical specification, and that will be a normative document. I will talk a bit more about that at the end of the webinar. We will look at the timeline of these standards. But just to let you know, that will not remain as a TR, so that makes it a bit more um, a more guiding us or makes that technical report a bit more interesting for us because it will not stay like this. It is just an in-between step. And maybe that is confusing, but just to let you know, unfortunately, if that whole thing will turn into TS, the number will also change. So if you will ever hear something about the TS5083, that is the same thing, <laughs> like a technical report for 804. Unfortunately, they, they changed the number, right? Uh, okay, you cannot change that. We have to live with that. That is just information for you. Yeah. We talked about the safe and secure function. That is a new concept coming with that uh, new DTR4804 with that risk-based approach. And that says, okay, if you fulfill all the three uh, standards here, we have mentioned already, and which are not replaced, then by definition, you have a safe and secure function. From an academic point of view, that's not true. There's a lot of things not being worked out. You see it by the table here below. So there are a lot of things not sufficiently covered by these standards, but at least by the three here on the left side. Uh, but by definition, we don't have a better one. So these, fulfilling these three standard means to have a safe and secure function. If we look a bit deeper to, to uh, compare vision of these standards, then we see, okay, the three existing ones are more on level one and two automation. The new one is on level three and four, the TR484. That is a significant difference. And the other threes are more in the process and guidance area, process goals and guidance area, more the classic process-related standards. The ic 2 is, of course, more or less the benchmark for that because it's 1,000 pages and it's much bigger than the others. But from the concept here, all the three are on the same level. But from the technical level here, from the technical level point of view, uh, uh, we see here, um, yes, again, ic 2 is not so bad. But the others not providing so much guidance on technical solutions. But the ICTF TR4803 
Azure One does provide that. So that is very much about technical solutions without determining one solution. It's on a functional level, finally. You will see that in the next slides. But that is one of the prominent things uh, coming in now by, by ISO TR4, A04. Um, so it's levels three and four, and it's technical solutions. These those keywords should be should be in your mind if you think about ISO TR4, A04. Yeah, another thing you should know, it's not the most important thing, but even a new term comes in, that is the dependability term. Maybe you heard about that. That is the same thing like in automotive, at least. It's the same thing of a safe and secure function. It's also called a dependable function. Dependability has different domains. In, in our case, it's exactly the three known standards. But the same term is also known in other industries. They like call it oft ramps. That is then reliability, availability, maintenance, safety, and security. Just that you know that we are moving into a direction in the automotive that we meet even terms from other industries like aerospace, right, and and all train business and and such kind of um, vehicles, which are quite different to to a car, of course. But that's just just for information that you have about the term. So. Before we move into the technical stuff, a bit about um, what we know and what we don't know. So if we talk about safe and secure function, that is a definition by those three standards, then let's have a quick look or make a deep dive into how it's implemented. So if we look at, uh, to a kind of full stack of ANGLE-D, SOTIF, and CAL-4, CAL stands for the standard security assurance level, so that's the highest level you can have. How would that be implemented? On the level one, two side, we have a very clear picture. You see here the classic functional safety, safety mechanism, for instance. E2E protection range checks, watchdog, whatever. Then you see here more sophisticated, maybe uh, safety mechanisms like lockstep, memory protection. You see for security, stuff like message authentication or secure bootloader. That is all what we know in terms of technical implementation of safe and secure functions for level one and two. We look into the area level three and four and five, we will not uh, put that uh, level one and two implementation stuff out of sight. We would not remove it or replace it. It will be still there, but it, it will be more and more an architecture question. So it's not just having single safety mechanisms. It's about the overall architecture we have to uh, cover to make level three, four, and even five uh, automation level system possible. So that is, of course, a question. It's at least partially answered by the ISO TR4804. Okay, uh, because we are now more in the middle, a bit more than the middle of the of the presentation of the webinar, maybe it's time for a short break. Uh, I hope that my host has picked up a few questions from from the audience, from you, um, and because it makes sense to answer maybe the most important ones. Before we just, just just go ahead, that you get a few answers even right in between. Yeah, thanks, Arnulf, and hello to everybody out there listening to the webinar. Up to now, three questions uh, for okay. you, Arnulf. Uh, let's yeah. start with the first one. Does the TR4804 replace the existing standards of functional safety and cybersecurity? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I touched the point a bit, right? That is an often misunderstanding because if you read the TR for ATO4, they are very much referring to the, these, uh, at least the three na named standards like functional safety, the so different to cyber security, and they re repeat here and there a bit from the content, but that is because it's a report, so it's not a clear requirements uh, statement, so it's more explanation. So should not get the message that ISO TR for ATO4 is replacing them. It's Exactly, or I have phrased it as tying them together under one risk based approach. The idea is by another standard, that maybe it's confusing, but to help to tie these many standards together to one approach, of course, only for higher levels of automation. For lower levels, we can live with these three standards, but for higher levels, it's really hard to find guidance there uh, in those three standards. So that is a bit tricky. So we are putting another standard to the existing three in terms of making them better or more clear for higher level. It could cause or that could create the impression that it's replacing them. 
no, it's not the intention. Uh, the same team is the same technical committee as the ISO is working on the TR, right? Then they do it on the functional safety and cybersecurity and sort of so same people more or less. So we'll, they will not replace their own work. That sounds good. <laughs> <laughs> uh, next question: What is about artificial intelligence? Is that covered somewhere in the known automotive safety standards? Yeah, I crossed that very. Quickly on one slide, so yes, in this standard, the ICTR 4804, you find one annex about what we know about uh, how to deal with neural networks in the automotive industry on board. It's just on the onboard part. And even you find a bit in the SOTIF standard, but they are all in the annexes. There are no requirements. They are also, also informative. The reason for that is that the guys who are writing these standards said, we want to contribute uh, to the audience or to the community of automotive companies what we know already. We don't want to hide it because just because we don't have the full picture. So what you see there is a portion. It is a more about methods, how we train neural networks, that we have to have different data sets for, 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 for verification and for training and so on. Some basics are there. But the picture is not a full picture concerning safety because we have no solution technically, not on the standard side, not only on the standard side. We have technically currently no no solution, lots of research and ideas, but there's no solution in place currently how to make sure that a kind of chaotic system like a neural network, which can, which based on data and is not coded by a human being, to make that safe, to ensure that to a certain likelihood, it will always make the intended decision without having a human being in there who has written the code. That problem is not solved. We have a lot of good methods. We have good ideas how to deal with that. And I think the next five, 10 years, we will have solutions for that. But today, point of view is we simply don't know it, so it cannot be in the standard. But we, on the other hand, we don't want to ignore that topic. That is at least a statement of the guys who are writing these standards. But they say we have to contribute what we know. And if we don't know, we cannot change that. But we have to wait until the community or research has found out how to deal with that. OK, last question for now is more like a statement. But maybe, Arnold, you can uh, say something to that. Yeah. Uh, it's written, I think the ISO 21448 DIS has to consider automation level above L2. Uh, which was the standard was named there in the statement? The ISO 21448. Yeah, so the ISO 21448, uh, that is the SOTIF standard, right? And that is uh, the current status is it's a PIS version, so it's a preliminary version. And they have a kind of disclaimer in there. They say, we are mainly writing this standard about level one and two. Yes, you can use it on higher levels of automation, but you have to apply additional measures. That's the definition or the constraint they have put on that. But of course, they're working on, on the SOTIF sort of standards. There will be a new version uh, somewhere at the beginning of next year. Uh, and they plan also to cover their higher levels of automation. But of course, they, will, they don't want to replace the TR4804 with that, right? So they still stay in the SOTIF sort of scope with that. But today, point of view is it, really, it is more written about level one and two. But the term so different, the concept, of course, is applying to higher levels uh, of automation too. Right? But the standard does not provide any guidance. OK, thanks, Arnold. That's uh, all for now. OK, thank you, Thomas. Thank you, guys, for providing questions. Um, yeah, let's uh, move on to, to the last third of that webinar cut off uh, about the technical solutions I have promised you. So behind uh, uh, the E architecture, big big block or black uh, black box, um, what is there behind? What is provided by ISO tier 4A04? OK, before we do this, we have to look at the engineering approach behind ISO TR4804. That is the engineering approach behind the standard. It's not your or shall not be your engineering approach. It's already carried out by the standard or by the technical report. It is a funny thing. It's very, you don't find it in some other uh, standards. So they start with 12 principles of automated driving. So they 
derived from, from laws, public authorities, custom associations worldwide, they derive somehow what makes a car safe in general. And they derive 12 principles. We will have a look at these 12 principles. That is a kind of very theoretical piece of work that is already provided by the standards. You don't need to do that. So you can see these 12 principles of, as a kind of uh, high level requirement for automated driving or safe and secure automated driving. So these high level requirements are then allocated to a high level architecture of capabilities. So kind of uh, they looked for, for a priori solution for these 12 principles. What would be a general architecture in terms of capabilities have to be provided by a car um, to implement these 12 principles. And they found out they, yeah, they defined somehow 13 capabilities, seven fail safe capabilities and six fail degraded capabilities. We will have to have a look at this what's behind. So in total, it's 13 capabilities and they form a kind of high level functional architecture. But that is the high level version. There's still a lower level of functional architecture is because for each capability, we have a set of elements, or logical elements, you can say function blocks or something. They have defined in the standard. You don't need to do that by your own. It is done by the standard. And these elements now forming the overall logical architecture, they call generic architecture. It is spoken in terms of ISO 2262, a kind of functional safety concept layer uh, architecture on a functional level. It is not the golden example for every kind of architecture. It is a reference architecture. So they try to give a guidance there. So if you have no idea, start with that architecture. But of course, uh, technology is evolving. They cannot write in a standard which is out there for years, the latest, uh, hottest topics, news, technologies from uh, from automated driving, right? So that's the reason why they stay on a functional level because that will not change so fast. Implementation might be new sensors, new, new controllers and stuff, but not new functions. So they stay on functional levels there. And of course, that they are open to new functions that don't want to predict the future uh, on that for that architecture level. Uh, so that's the reason why they call it the reference architecture, right? But as always, if ISO as an international document provides something and publish something, that is seen as a kind of golden example, right? Because many, many companies searching for, for, for kind of starting points for their um, work in automated driving or they're searching for kind of reference architectures to compare their own solution to and so on. So that will be a kind of, uh, maybe a golden example, but the idea is more to provide a reference. So the way we have to go now is principles, capabilities, and then have a look at some examples in that generic architecture. So let's start with the uh, principles. So it's a, a set of 13, uh, or 12, sorry, 12 principles. It starts with the overall principles, as you see how how high level that is. So cybersecurity, for instance, is one principle, right? It is surprisingly simple. So that means if you want to be safe, you have to protect your ADAS or your uh, automatically driving system, your ADS. You have to protect it against threats from the outside. Uh, if you want to be uh, safe in automated driving, you have to do data recording. Even passive safety is in there. That means the mechanical layout of the car has to be considered, has, has to be designed according automated driving. Because for instance, the driver is not seating in his driver's seat. Maybe he is on the uh, front passenger seat or maybe he is walking around in his car. I don't know, right? So even passive safety is a principle we have to regard. And even we have to do safety assessments. Uh, and what we know from functional safety has to be also applied for automated driving. That's the overarching uh, principles. And below that, we have uh, eight further principles, uh, more more detailed, let's say, about you have to assure safe operations. You have to assure that the behavior in traffic, for instance, is understandable for other cars and for other human beings. You have to uh, determine the ODD, that is a typical term from automated driving, the operational design domain. So that depends on the automation feature, what is your operational design domain. So a traffic jam assistant has a different uh, ODD than the highway assistant, right? So the traffic jam just looks uh, 10 meters around 
and the highway assistant have to look 150 meters ahead of the car to see what's upcoming there, right? Because you're on a much higher speed. And we have, of course, human factors. Uh, we have to consider role of the users. So we have not just the driver, we have people in the car, sitting there, we have people around the car. So we have, of course, the driver. You know, on level three, for instance, we have to think about how to initiate takeover of control between driver and car. So these are all principles, right? I have a solution. You can see it as requirements. And now we have to look at the uh, high level uh, architecture side, the capabilities. Uh, that looks a bit like this. That follows the sense, plan, and act paradigm we know from robotics. So we have uh, at the starting point seven fail safe um, capabilities. So these uh, capabilities can just switched, be switched off in case of a failure. That's the idea behind the term uh, fail safe. Is in known even from ISO 362, it's not a new term. So we have here seven of these um, capabilities. Every high level, for instance, determine the location of the ego vehicle, sense outside and perceive relevant static and dynamic object outside on the road, predict the future behavior of relevant objects that is on the sending side. On the acting side is, okay, you have a plan now how to, how to drive on which path so execute that plan and actually, yeah, and drive uh, accurately on that, con yeah, on that path you have planned, and so on. So, but there's another set of capabilities. If FDs, the fail degraded, they cannot just fail. We at least need a degraded uh, uh, or reduced functionality for these functionality because the car will not be safe in the in terms of an automatically driving car if the wire lab. Um, uh, uh, capabilities are not there. They cannot just fail safe. For instance, funny thing, you have to detect when degradation is not available. So that is something new coming now in uh, from in the safety thinking that even if you do not automatically drive, maybe the driver is in charge or maybe the, you drive automatically and the system works perfectly. But you see that your redundant functionality is not there anymore. So if there it would be a failure now or a, a limitation of your of your performance, then you cannot degrade. So that means someone has to handle that. That typically means if I cannot degrade, then there is no uh, um, uh, fail degraded uh, activity possible. That means at least for a while, even in a failure situation, I can drive the car into a safe situation, maybe stopping the car, reducing speed or whatever, or let the car, let the driver take over responsibility here. So if that is not possible, so I have to stop automatic driving, even if it's still good, right? So this is a new concept of availability makes safety. It's coming in with that uh, architecture on a, even on a high level here. Yeah, I'll give you some, some examples, yeah. Uh, dynamic dynamic entities and static entities have to be detected, which are required for the automatic driving system. You have to determine your location inside your ODD, right? That does not mean the absolute uh, coordinates worldwide. It could also mean I'm on the highway on the right lane. Even that is the location. And of course, you have to predict uh, future behavior of all the uh, objects in your ODD. Um, that you can predict their future behavior and that you can make your planning about your driving paths. These are just examples what behind these capabilities. Of course, every of these capabilities has its own description. Yeah, again, the FD, please uh, definition what's behind fair degraded, provide a safe system for a specific time until minimal risk conditions are reached. So that's the precise definition of what fair degraded means. Okay, you don't want to go through the fail now. It's clear if you Arnold? allocate. Yes, sorry. May I interrupt you? Because there was yep. a question coming in. I think it's uh, exactly about uh, what you're talking uh, about at the moment. Uh, the question is yep. hello. So here the fail degraded only accesses the level three or below. Is that right? No, it's, uh, it's about level three and four. So fail degraded uh, is not limited to level three. So in the architecture, you need even for level four, you need that fail degrade functionality, 
uh, even, because even there you have to detect um, my uh, am I still in the right ODD, right? That is true for level three and four because uh, still we have um, features there which are limited because it's not level five. Still the driver is there with different responsibilities and in different in specific scenarios you have to take over for instance or you have to reduce speed because something is not working. That is true for level three and four. At least it's one reason we have still the driver there. So that's why we need to fail degraded. At least for a certain period of time, you have to, even in case of failures, you have to assure that the car is not harming somebody before the driver is back in responsibility. That can take a few seconds, right? That is the idea of cannot be fail safe. Fail safe means, uh, I don't know, uh, my, my, uh, my, a, my ACC I have today in my car, just measuring the distance to the next impaired driving car and, and braking if I'm too close. That can be switched off because the driver is anyway there. He still has his hands on the steering wheel and has his feet on the pedals, right? So we don't need a specific system there to fail degrade it. We can just switch off and make, make the uh, telltale on, hey, your ACC is not working. It works. But if you are reading your emails, right, that happens in level three and four, and suddenly something happens, my function is not working anymore, there has to be something in between before I'm back in control, right? Before I have laid down my 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 my, uh, my mobile phone and have to back my hands on the steering wheel and know what's going on on the road out there, right? That's the reason for the fail degraded. Okay, thanks and sorry for interruption. No problem. Okay, yeah, uh, we have just uh, been in the position to to tie these things together, right? Principles and capabilities. That can be seen as a kind of uh, traceability table, like you see it here, right? We don't need to go through all the process. That is an example of how principles can be assigned to capabilities. That is the example provided by, by the standard. But of course, they say in a specific project, it can be different, right? Uh, and even to see it here, passive safety, for instance, that is not, uh, not assigned to any of these capabilities because passive safety is a mechanical thing. It has no allocation target in an EE system, right? So that is, uh, but to give you one example, um, yeah, if you look here, again, to determine location as one of the more uh, simple capabilities, what does that table say? That says, okay, cybersecurity has to be assured even for determined location. We have to do a safety assessment. And if you look into these more technical principles, to, to behave in traffic according rules and to manage situation within ODD, to, to the concrete location is needed, right? If you don't know where you are, you don't know the apply applicable rules, and you don't know if you are still in your operational design domain. Right? That is that is the how you can read this table. Yeah, I don't want to go through that. It's the same table, just to see here now the fail degraded uh, capabilities, same principles, a few more crosses, right? But the same concept. So if we now look a bit deeper, I promise you to go a bit deeper to the functional level, not just on the, not just stay on the capability level. You see here two example capabilities. One is perceive the relevant static and dynamic object, and then based on that, determine location within the ODD. How is that done? According to the ISO TR4804. Then they provide you a picture like this. That is now a functional architecture, right? So you see now perception sensors, a priori perception sensors, ego motion of the car, that then you take advantage on uh, sensor fusion, which is in the other uh, capability, it's put in here, and that all contributes now to the function localization, and then you get the current local location out of that. So environment perception is clear that it's a typical radar camera with a LiDAR system a priori that is taken from a map maybe that is a static um, information from, from the outside world, um, uh, traffic signs, I don't know, tunnels, buildings, whatever is on the map and helps me to localize. And of course, uh, Eagle Motion says, is my car still in that ODD? So is the speed okay? Is the position of the car uh, okay, so if I'm on the right lane, all the stuff that is also um, uh, tied to the ego motion uh, function, and that all together brings me to, to to the right localization, which depends, of course, on the features I have on my car, on the level three and four features, right? That is different. Uh, localization is a different uh, function uh, if you have uh, different uh, automated driving features on your car. Okay, but of course the function 
the functional architecture will not change accordingly. It will be like this, but on a more detailed level, it of course depends what sensors do you do you have and what kind of automatic driving features you want to support. Yeah, so that means finally that those elements, they implementing the capabilities, generic architecture, but they do not represent the features itself. So to make one thing clear, if you, for instance, pick up a typical level three feature, it's a traffic jam chauffeur system, a kind of automatically driving system supports me in a traffic jam. So the driver can read my newspaper or whatever. And during the time I'm below a certain speed and uh, surrounded by cars in a traffic jam. So my car is automatically moving my car ahead step by step. So that uh, traffic jam uh, system is now built upon that architecture. I have just shown here the functional, uh, the fail safe uh, capabili uh, capabilities. The others I've just cited, just to keep the, simple, the picture simple. And anyway, that picture is not complete, but if you want to build up the traffic jam chauffeur system, then you, you need again your surrounding vehicles from the FS2, from perceived relevant static and dynamic objects. That includes, of course, even the elements below the uh, capabilities. You need to find out where is my ego car on the highway, which lane I'm in on, and what cars are around me. And, and finally, I have to plan my trajectory, uh, trajectory uh, to drive and, sh and, and steer the car. Maybe if I have to change lanes or something. So this is all done then on the uh, correctly, correctly execute and actuate the driving plan. And of course, there are more dependencies. But just, just to give you the idea how, how automatically driving features for level three and four, how they are built upon that architecture. Of course, the details, that is one example taken from, from the annex of ISO TR4804, but they have just a few examples there. So they have no complete picture for all features, right? Don't get that information or that message. It is still just a few examples to help you understanding the uh, functional architecture. Okay, as a summary, coming to an end of that uh, webinar, um, I promise you a bit of timeline about the standards because it's a bit complex, right? So in the red, you see the involvement of the ISO TR484. So it was released end of 19, so not so far, not so long time ago, right? So we have one year, let's say, a bit more. We know that TR, the technical report, then they have started end of 2021 uh, to turn it into the technical specification, but that will take a while. And you see uh, somewhere first quarter, uh, end of first quarter 2023, we will have that release. So it always takes a while on the ISO committees to, to finally publish something because you have to internationally agree on that, right? So, but if you know today the ISO TR4804, you, you will not be surprised by the changes. It will be not a totally different picture uh, if you will then we then see the TS5083. It's more international agreements than it's creating more pages. Yeah, but even you see a bit of the other standards on it. So we have a, we have the ISO 21448 SPAS since. The beginning of, of 19, uh, so there is a plan to release a real ISO 21448 uh, beginning of 2022 next year. They already start working on ISO 2632 third edition, and even that might be a surprise, but that is just a start. That will take another, I don't know, five years, uh, three to five years until we see the, sec the third edition of ISO 2632 functioning safety. And for the security experts under you, you know that the new ISO 21434 will be published finally in this year. You see a lot of work for those guys who are working on the ISO standards and because that's not because they have free time, that is because technology is evolving so fast. They have to deal with that speed. Yeah, as a summary, um, I think the generic architecture of the ISO TR484 is the most distinguishing uh, piece uh, by this standard compared to the others. Uh, again, goal is not to replace uh, the known standards, uh, functional safety, so different cyber security to tie them together. And yes, the dependency term is really challenging everybody who is an engineer in the industry, the automotive industry. So of course, the, the recommendation of the consultant is always uh, for your projects, you need guidance 
platform consulting experts who know the standards, but they also know practical projects and have practical development experiences. That brings me uh, to my last topic, of course, uh, what we can do for you uh, as a consulting company, uh, the automated driving is not its own topic currently. It is embedded in the what we call trust. That means in safety and security area. But maybe we move in the direction that we will create its its own product out of it. But currently, it's it's uh, it's one topic inside safety and security. And so we have a lot of lots of experts in these areas. And also, we can provide lots of trainings there. So that's the final page. So if you are interested in more details, that is true for functional safety and for so different cybersecurity, of course. Uh, we have currently no dedicated training for automated driving, but that is something we are working on. So if you are interested in that, let us know. So uh, access our own pages for the training stuff and let the people there know that you will be interested in uh, automated driving. Of course, you can set up such a training, but currently there is none. But for all the known standards, we have trainings. And not only trainings, we have further webinars upcoming. You see that here below on that slide in the next uh, few weeks about function safety, about automotive cybersecurity. And of course, we'd like to invite you to our next big virtual event this year. That's the Vector Forum 2021 about software-driven innovation. For sure, there will be automated driving in there. A lot of companies presenting there. You can access the agenda even by, by the Vector Consulting Services homepage, you will find the speakers there and the topics. So you are invited to that. Okay, that's so far from my side. Thank you for, for being here, for staying here for that webinar. Um, and thank you for the questions and, and hope I can see you soon uh, somewhere in our trainings or in our projects we do with the companies in the area of safety, security, and, and of course, automated driving. And, and uh, yeah, I will, of course, now stay a bit longer here to try to answer remaining questions. So stay tuned what is ongoing here at Vector, and have a nice day and stay healthy. Goodbye.